have uh, has, uh, somebody got the slides on her mail? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you are I'm now in the process of opening it. I'll wait a bit till you succeed. And then we will have a very, a very, very complicated task to open the second slide and uh, not looking at the third one. <laughs> so I was just, I was just going to ask you if somebody recognizes the verses. He was uh, he was thrown by the storm uh, in lands and seas. So the word for sea is alive there. Uh, mm, there we have only the adjective alto, uh, and it uh, I think it has to be interpreted there as uh, lands at and the place. And the and profound place. Uh, the, uh, the vast part of Ine uh, tells us how the Ine, how Ine is voyaged by sea, right? And in the very end of this passage, Albanique Patris, Atualtai Moinia Romae. What does Altai Moinia Romae mean? Who started playing the year? So, high walls of Rome. So the the hero of this passage, Aeneas, was the uh, ultimate founder of Rome and its high walls. So, a very nice case of policing uh, the word uh, altus in Latin can mean both deep like deep sea and high slide four it is alto mare deep sea altissima plumina the deepest river I think it is a mm, quotation from Julius Caesar and him man's, uh, by the way, sand. Uh, something like a deep well, and so on. In the same time, we can meet high walls of Rome, a high fire, a high tower, a tall column, for example. With uh, with the same, with just the same adjective. So, slide five. It's a nice case of polyfunctionality. A collectification. Uh, so, if you attended the uh, first two morning classes by uh, Katya Rakhilin and Masha Kapchevsky, then you know that this is what this is that what the most collectical technological enterprise is all about collectifications so uh, in this course we'll uh, <coughs> discuss some collectifications of uh, words like high tall deep and so on 
So please note that the mm, latent the latent case of calcification is uh, not a, an idea of syncrasy. Is uh, not by chance. So in Komi, a Finno-Ugrian language spoken uh, in the very north of Russia, we made exactly the same pattern. So uh, there is uh, a word which sounds really horribly. Drudrid. Yeah, and uh, so it means it can be applied to snow, to rivers, to pits, to fences, to trees, and so on. So just the same case. Well, slide six. Uh, mm, the uh, so this project is a joint work of uh, of me and my colleague from the Manosov Moscow State University, Marie Previsenza. The division of labor between us is very simple. Uh, all good and strong points are to think here, and all uh, weak points and shortcomings are to blame me. Uh, so the photo, the photo uh, presents us doing field work at uh, in Ishmaqomi, so the very language where we have found the same poly polyfunctional pattern like in Latin. So, uh, and yeah, we are going to deal with the cross linguistic variation of uh, dimensional terms. I do not uh, say dimensional adjectives because. Uh, well, yes, uh, in most cases they are adjectives, if a language uh, mm, uh, if a has that category. In just few languages of our sample, uh, they are verbs. Because, uh, for example, Tantra Nanatsu Chukchi does not have uh, that many adjectives. So we call dimensional terms uh, uh, those that describe one of the one of the dimensions of a certain physical object, uh, not big or small, no. wide, thick, high, long, etc. So the field was. Uh, in fact, started previously. Mm. Manfred Birvich and David Lang, uh, based on a sample of uh, 15 languages, including some European languages and Mandarin Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, too, uh, started ways of conceptualiz conceptualization of wooden boards. So uh, the picture on the slide 7. Mm. So on the very left of the picture you can see a very abstract wooden board. In the middle it is a chest of drawers. And uh, on the right it's a window sill. So they claim that uh, so mm, Mm, the ways of concept conceptualization dimensions are language specific. For example, for Chinese speakers, the uh, largest dimension of wooden board will always be long. So the term which is equivalent in long. And the second largest dimension would always be wide. It's not the case for Korean as they claim. In Korean, uh, it, the conceptualization is, uh, depends on the axis of the observer's view. Uh, so mm, all three pictures would be the same for Chinese speaker, at least uh, mm, if Birch and Blanca are right. But for Korean speaker, 
if you go to adjustment drawers and look at it like that, this dimension would be y. Uh, and if you go to a window sill uh, and stand in front of it, this dimension would be y. But if you go, for example, to chest of drawers uh, from, from another point of view, uh, it is another dimension that would be conceptualized as y. So, it's a very subtle thing. Maybe they are right, but um, our objective is other. We um, maybe more boring. We aim at constructing a semantic map and uh, capturing the cases of collectification, like we just we have just seen in Lakin and in Kumi. Yeah, slide eight. Our project is a part of the most lexical typological uh, team enterprise, and um, necessarily. It glosses over the subtle differences, uh, like uh, those culture-specific patterns of conceptualization. So. So, and as it is often the case with our team, dictionaries are insufficient. So, can't make. Uh, large scale typology based by dictionaries. We use only questionaries in Cooper. So the access to speakers who can fill in questionaries are is complicated and uh, uh, good Cooper languages are even more pure. So that's why our sample slide nine is a convenient sample. It consists of approximately 40 languages. Uh, it is maybe too far a convenient sample. So mm, it is highly biased. It is not a duration with very few exceptions. So maybe mm, my course should, uh, should have been called the typology of dimensions of not another duration. So we have standard average European languages and some languages of Russia. Uh, we have Chukchi, we have Buryat, we have Tandrananis, but it seems for some universal claims uh, it, is, mm, it is too weak. But maybe we can make just universal claims about our sample. Yeah. As uh, we, my colleague and I, are Uralic languages, we do field work with Uralic languages, uh, we have nearly all genera of Uralic. Uh, Finnish, Moksha, Hilmari, Medomari, Edmur, Komiziran, Western Hunti, and two Samoyedic languages, Dandrunanath and Danasan, the latter thanks to Ivan. Oh, mm. Then to agree to help us here in his Ganesan field trip. Uh, yeah, and if you decide to join this class uh, tomorrow, we'll discuss some family biases which uh, can, uh, which uh, we'll, we'll probably see uh, an example of the Uralic family. So assume, slide 10, you want to describe one of the dimensions of a certain physical object. Then how are you going to indicate, to indicate what dimension you are describing? So if you just modificate a random noun with a random, with a random adjective. So you need to know uh, to what dimension of the referent of the noun you apply the qualities the adjective describes. So it turns out that mm, dimensional adjectives cannot describe random objects. So we cannot say tall ball. So balls can be either big or small. Why? 
because um, they have no cell in dimensions. So we can, it's obvious, we can just speak of their uh, general size. The same thing with geese or headphones. So they have a highly elaborated shape. They have no cell in dimensions. So we are now going to deal only with physical objects that are that have some salient dimensions. The dimensions can be salient either on the basis of their of the inherent spatial properties uh, of objects like shape or size. Uh, so the pan is elongated, and so I may. Uh, mm, I may pick out its largest dimension and describe it as long or short. On the basis of the ways humans interact with such objects. So, uh, there can be a pit in the earth. It can be of some very vague shape, but as I am above it, and I am standing, I am typically standing on the earth and looking down on it, the axis of my view, the axis uh, so co coincides with the dimension I can describe as deep or shallow. Yeah. Uh, so um, my first uh, my first claim, my first point is that all dimensional terms like thick, long, etc., have a kind of presupposition. When you assert that the object is thick, you assume it has a, it has a dimension it can be thick in. Is it clear? Uh, you assume that it belongs to uh, one of the several, uh, as you say, topological classes which can be thick. So if we say in English that something is thick, it is either elongated, like this pen, or flat, like this sheet of paper. Alternatively, uh, such objects can coerce a noun into such class. So a lake need not be elongated, but a long lake has to be that. And I think a white lake uh, also should uh, have a stripish form. So, uh, else we just um, cannot describe it as why. So, it turned out that for all languages of our sample, all objects which can be described with, with uh, the dimension terms agglomerate around a small number of prototypical shapes. Of course, if we zoom in, uh, if we Mm, if you aim at making some point grain distinctions, more and more subtle semantic opposition can always be provided. However, some distinctions prove to be typologically relevant and some are not. So it's a key. So we have Kazakh, a Turkic language, uh, spoken uh, mostly in Kazakhstan and two adjectives, ANSYS and TAR, which uh, could both be trans uh, translated as narrow. They are complementarily distributed uh, with nouns of different typological nature. We have boards, roads and homes. Boards can be described only with Ansys, but not tar. And so the passages, uh, no, so the ribbons, stripes in a dress, uh, stripes of land between, say, the rock and the sea, and so on. And narrow spaces, uh, like uh, roads, rivers, bridges, passages, tubes, doors, 
should be described with tar and this is infelicitous. So we uh, draw a distinction between narrow superficies spaces and flat and long artifacts. Some other distinction turned out to be relevant for dimensional terms. So mm, the way we estimate that we lexify the length and thickness of elongated objects is independent of whether I flexible like ropes or threads or rigid like sticks or bones. So in slide 15 you can see the topological classes which turned out to be relevant so far. So we have elongated, just elongated objects like these pen. Ropes, threads, sticks, fingers, bones, etc. And a particular subclass of fields, which is vertically fixed, which is placed on the earth and is vertically fixed. Trees, guideposts, columns, and us humans. So, if we are, say, tall, we are tall just like trees and guideposts. Then barriers, things which can be high mm, but are not, well, do not, do not have a form of a theory. Different piles, mountains, walls, fences, ramparts, and so on. And two kinds of layers. So uh, maybe the labels are uh, mm, not that good. Uh, mm, often mistakenly name them interpretable layers and then interpretable layers. Impenetrable layers, so just layers you, a hum, an observer cannot get in. Books, blankets, boards, eyes, clothes, the things which can be thick or thin and have one dimension. And penetrable layers. Uh, the objects you can plunge into snow, mud, and sand. Then, slide 16 stripes, which can be long and wide, ribbons, wooden boards, stripes in a dress, roads. Uh, they are mm, so uh, they are of striker sheep. But the observer can go, for example, along the road and thus be, uh, so to say, inside its surfaces, like fields, blades, and yards. So, uh, no uh, elongated shape, uh, but the observer can still be inside it. Mm, holes, like doors, windows, and holes in a wall, tubes. Like chimneys, pipes, corridors, barrows. <coughs> so a hole which is elongated, different pits, ditches, trenches, etc., and water, bo water bodies which are pits filled with water. Next slide. So uh, mm, the frames, the atomic functions of our semantic map would be dimensions of a particular topological class. So long periods is one frame, and thick periods are certainly another frame, and these two frames are never collectified uh, in our sample, but I guess it's universal. So uh, you won't get long, thick policy. Yeah, mm, and... Mm, there are two antonymical subdomains. The first one, to which thick, wide, deep, long terms uh, belong to large size subdomains. And the other one, to which their antonyms belong. Narrow, short, shallow, thin, and so on. And this distinction, which, like in Kazakh, 
was tested for the small size uh, subdomain, we project into the large size subdomain and vice versa. So to make, to make a semantic map and thus we hope to capture symmetries at the later stages. So the semantic map uh, is built uh, by uh, with a very regular procedure like uh, on the slide 18. So Kaza, as we have just seen, uh, lexifies in a position between narrow stripes versus narrow rows and narrow holes. Tandemness by in contrast uh, merges narrow stripes and rows but lexifies differently narrow holes. Uh, so so far we have not occurred uh, occurred we so far we have not met uh, the pattern in which narrow stripes and narrow holes would be collectified and narrow rows uh, would be lexified differently. So, so far we made uh, the following piece of a semantic map stripes, roads, and holes. So, and slide 18. It turned out that our semantic map turned out to be a field itself. It is very long and thin just a chain of frames, so something like a hierarchy uh, uh, lacking, uh, the, uh, lacking the implicational, uh, the implicational features of the hierarchy but uh, it is, so to say, one dimension it is, does not even fit in the slide so we divided our domain into two parts and today I'm going to discuss the first one, which is called Latus. Uh, so Latus is a Latin term for white, and uh, Latus is a part of the dimensional domain, uh, which contains thick, white, broad, etc. The another part is called Altus, and we have divided we have divided it not only. Uh, Mm, for the sake of, of fitting the map uh, into the slide but, mm, also uh, because of the fact that the boundary, the boundary between them is very southern violated the collectification between long, tall, and deep and thick, wide road is um, it occurred, uh, occurs very um, very seldom. So, uh, however, I think the speaker of one of such languages is among us now. Can you guess who, uh, which language it is? Do not uh, express your thoughts right now. I know the question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if some details. Maybe because of bad uh, knowing of English terms. But uh, narrow holes, uh, what mean? What means narrow, uh, narrow hole? Like narrow so for us, hole is just labeled for one dimensional object, which, ha which, ha which, has sp uh, which consists of space. Uh, in uh, some objects, so a door, a window, a hole in a fence, a hole in a pocket, uh, I don't know, uh, and ever, and anything. Uh, and and it can be wide and narrow. I'm, I think, uh, like, mm, and uh, most often it is uh, there only dimension, if it is, for example, a round hole in something. Okay, and about door, 
what the difference between narrow door and wide door? Uh, between the, a narrow door and, and a wide, wide door. door. So I th I assume that basically the same like uh, yeah. between the it's a narrow door. It's a narrow door, yeah. So, uh, slide 20 presents you our whole semantic map. So you are not supposed to read the labels because it was supposed to be on the screen. Uh, you uh, were to have no opportunity to uh, see what is written here, but just look at it very briefly. Uh, open slide 21 and so um, remember the impression of the symmetry we have on our semantic map. Uh, especially in lexics, uh, especially in lexics, uh, semantic ma maps are seldom that symmetrical. So, uh, um, we've seen the temperature maps of Marie Kapchaska town. Have you seen? Uh, the temperature sem semantic maps for hot and cold. Anybody? No? So uh, then you can believe me that Marshall's uh, semantics map, Marshall's semantic maps are highly uh, asymmetrical. Hot is lexified in one way, and cold is lexified another way. And if you imagine some uh, distinctions which can be drawn between the domains of sharp and blonde, or say uh, tight and loose, so uh, in spite of our treating of them as antonyms, typologically the patterns of classification mm, are very similar to each other. With the dimension, it's uh, at, at least mm, with the, mm, at least on the stage of a semantic map, it is perfectly symmetrical. Uh, there, there are cases of asymmetrical classification, but they are not that abundant. So it's almost paradigm. And interestingly, there are some paradigmatic effects in the diachrony of uh, dimensional terms. So, on slide 22, so you, especially if you're, uh, you are a Russian speaker, you shouldn't uh, have any look on slide 23 until I uh, let you do so. In common Slavic, the dimensional terms had to attach one of suffixes, ok or uk. Uh, mm, if you uh, don't know what the letter year stands for, it is it's like a schwa. So D, the deep term, uh, could be mm, either glubok or glubuk. The high term, either vesok or vesuk, and so on. And this, this was not special for dimensional adjectives because, due to some morphophonological reasons, uh, a great amount of adjectives attached these affixes. But uh, what was special for dimensional adjectives uh, that they exhibit uh, some variation. The, in the earliest written sources of both, say, East Slavic or and South Slavic. Uh, and without any error pattern, uh, both ok and uk are attested. And uh, we can see that in the 12th and the 13th centuries, 
the variation is speed, each adjective goes to fixed term. And can you guess, especially some especially Russian speakers, what happened? Well, each suffix got its particular distribution, I guess. Yeah, and on what the distribution could have been based? Uh, Martin, if you uh, if you want to participate, I have to send you the slides. Uh, or you can just med you can just meditate. Uh, we hope that the projector. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have got away before next lecture, but now it is so safe. Should we not show us any insights? Yeah. So, uh, on what this uh, on uh, on what this uh, distribution? Uh, could have been based. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's logical, but it's not the case. So very uh, very simple. A large size versus small size. Continue the slides, and we are now discussing. Uh, so, and uh, I think, uh, so slide 23, you know, uh, it's already slide, slide 23, yes. Uh, uh, all large size adjectives uh, have, cho have chosen all, and all small size adjectives have chosen all. Since uh, since the 13th century, which is that way, uh, it's only Gluboki in Russian, but Melki, Vysoki, Vyniski, uh, without the vowel in the side in the, the side because the year has fallen. So uh, my claim is that this is a kind of paradigmatic level. It is presumably the same mechanism as you have in uh, uh, all other cases when morphological properties of the paradigms uh, get the same. So, to in order to make uh, the paradigm look, the the mm, cells of the paradigm look similar to each other. So, and this is, this is very particular of dimensional terms uh, because of striking symmetry of the semantic map uh, on, on how they are conceived. So, on slide 24, you can see the part of the map for layers. I layers are impenetrable layers, so just plain layers like Sheets of paper, eyes and clothes, pivots are pens, threads, ropes, stripes are stripes and wooden boards, then ropes, tubes and holes, tubes and uh, it is an L sample, tubes and holes are never lexified differently. The with uh, certain that holes can belong, uh, or tubes like corridors, barrels can belong, holes cannot be, uh, cannot. But in terms of width, they are always the same. And one more frame, which a bit breaks this symmetry, surfaces. <coughs> it's, uh, you know, broad fields, broad valleys, broad blades, yards, and so on. Uh, they need not be of stripish, elongated shapes. They can be just round. 
So, and uh, obviously, uh, mm, this uh, frame cannot have uh, its mm, mirror reflection in the antinomical zone because just if the surface is not very large, it uh, just uh, stops being considered the surface. It's maybe a piece of grass, but not a lead, a piece of space, but not a yard, and so on. Well, slide 25. The first, uh, the first distinction. Thick layers versus thick pillars. In English, in German, in Russian, and in fact in most standard, standard favorite European languages, we collectify these two frames. Uh, in many languages, they are lexified differently. It's common knowledge. For example, there are uh, we on slide 25 we have two examples from Kabardian and Kazakh. Uh, Kabardian has, I think, uh, the first word to be read just like "oo," "oo," and "pacha" for layers like for thick or thin paper or cloth, and the hummus and sero for thick, and th for thick or thin sticks and drops. Uh, the same thing is going on in Kazakh. Uh, slide 26. Uh, some in, in Caucasian linguistics, it is claimed that layers versus pills distinction in the zone of thick is a particular trait of uh, so-called Caucasian spark bond. It was uh, first uh, proposed by Vasily Bayer, who was a very um, famous Soviet linguist, and now it is uh, yeah, it is uh, suggested again by some com comparative linguists too. But, um, yeah, this pattern of classification is tested in Portfelian, according to Bicentury, which uh, the, not all these languages are in my sample. Um, these patterns are tested in Portfelian, not West Caucasian, not East Caucasian, and also set. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, maybe to speak of a family bias or of a narrow bias, we have uh, some more information about uh, what goes on in different parts of the world as, as well. Uh, that neither Bayer nor Chirigba have. In our sample, uh, this pattern is attested in Mandarin Chinese, in Tatar, in Kazakh, and in fact, in Shor. Uh, in other uh, South Siberian Tropic language, in the Kebo, uh, a Kwa language, in Western Hunting, in Tundra Nanets, and in Chukchi. And until prove the opposite, I think there is no point in seeing this pattern as characteristic of the Caucasian problem. Maybe it's very likely that it's in fact the SAE languages which, has, which have a bias against it. But, well, maybe more surprising is that these two frames are in fact classified, like in 27. Moksha merges layers in field, so the English and Russian, and uh, for example, uh, as you can see in slide 28. Notice Caucasian language Fudi, modern Hebrew, Eastern Armenian, and Turkic. Uh, I think it is. Mm, this tendency deserves an explanation. Because, uh, mm, so, even on our too far convenient sample, 
it is clear that it is a recurrent pattern. And it is really surprising that uh, they are collectified, uh, from at least very surprising from a very geometrical point of view, because, well, geometrically, layers like that and pivots like that have very little in common. So what's the matter? So, it's, uh, so layers are generally one-dimensional objects. If, for example, they are paper, they are, un I mean, uncountable layers, like paper and cloth, and pivots are, have all three dimensions. What's the, what's the case? Why collectify? How come? Uh, very often in such languages, besides dominant thick, there is often also a dominant, dominant Y term, so which covers, for example, white stripes, white roads, and white holes. So in fact, thick is opposed to white. The explanation seems to be like uh, maybe anthropocentric. It seems to lie in the ways the human which observes the object or uses the object interacts with it. So, both the thickness of pivots and the thickness of layers is prototypically estimated at hand. Uh, whereas, wide objects are prototypically perceived from inside. We go along the road, get into the hole, look into the tube etc. And so maybe the idea which lies under the dominant thick versus dominant wide opposition might be kind of maybe kind of sensor. So the concept conveyed by thick like terms, by dominant thicks, can be based on a particular sensory motor feeling, for example, and it conveyed by wide like terms has to, something to deal with our body schema. So the boundaries of our body, we have to check how far are they from the edges of the road, and if we're not very far, uh, the road is uh, perceived as narrow. And if the edges of the road are far away, the road is perceived to be wide. So, a Vizbitska like um, uh, explanation. Now, if so, uh, in the collectifying languages, both frames are covered with a word which, from the emic point of view, has such a single meaning. Uh, maybe sensory based, maybe a prototypical structure, but a single meaning. So, the collectification uh, of stripes, sort of, of thick pivots, and the clears uh, should have finally a representation explanation. There is a single concept, a single meaning, a single uh, signatum behind all these terms, which correspond to two frames, two atomic functions in our map. Uh, the zone of wide is uh, organized as follows, slide 31. So the three main frames are stripes, roads, and hips and holes. And we have already seen in Kazakh the opposition, the opposition between stripes versus roads and hips and holes. Tandrenance uh, exhibits uh, the system which is much the same so the term for white is dominant, but uh, mm, the distribution of two narrow terms is uh, a bit different. So narrow stripes, wooden boards, and also narrow rivers, bridges, and roads are covered with, uh, are described with the term pia, and uh, holes, windows, uh, doors, so uh, there are uh, there are certainly mm, certain problems with windows in Tundra Nets 
But mm, if they think of Windows, and if they think of uh, Luke's Law, uh, entrance to the tents, house in the air, clothes, clothes uh, they use adjective. Pick. Mm. So, uh, thus we uh, establish a turn of opposition. And uh, as I have already said, no language collectifies stripes, given holes, but leaves, roads. Mm. So, uh, and there, is, there are broad white surfaces, which need not be long, which are just why? Uh, mm, Ismokomi has a dedicated term for white surfaces. Stripes, roads, and cubes and holes in Ismokomi are white. And surfaces are pashkrib. That is, uh, historically it is a derivative of the, the word to open. Something like an open place. Sunday guns is a semantic shift and now it mm, denotes size of, of a blade, of a belly, of a part of tundra between say two hills and so on. In a bar the same opposition is conveyed indirectly. The term Ariba uh, applies to stripes, rows, giving holes, but not to surfaces. Uh, term Ratkidab in case of roads and tubes and holes seems to be exactly synonymical to Ayba. But, uh, well, uh, we, you can see that the opposition is lexicalized but in an indirect way. Mm. So, then we turn to the last point for today, the asymmetrical classification within the later zone. The boundary between pivots and stripes, so the boundary in SE languages, this is just the boundary between thick terms, because pivots are thick or thin, and white terms, because stripes, uh, they can be, of course, uh, mm, Thick or, thin, thick or thin in as layers in their uh, smallest uh, dimension, but in the second large dimension, then can be wide or narrow. Yeah? So, this boundary can it be violated in a large size and retained in small size, at least based on our sample. So, there are several languages which exemplify that, uh, but not only them. If the boundary is violated in large, si in large size, uh, it should be violated in small size. I think it can uh, be at least true for northern duration, from which the languages of our sample mostly come from. So, uh, the Asymmetrical system of Western hunting in 34. The white terms mm, are just like in English or Russian. Layers and pivots are thick, are thick coat. Stripes, roads, and tubes and holes are white, wooden. But in the zone of small sizes, something interesting goes on. Uh, the term Lukoch is dedicated only to layers. And the term Vash covers holes, tubes, roads, stripes, and pivots at the same time. Thin, thick, thin rope, narrow bore, narrow a road are lexified uh, the same way in front.
uh, slightly different thing in the boy then. Uh, slide 35. Uh, this part here mm, is a dedicated narrow term for layers, and then we have uh, a dedicated thin term for thin layers, and then we have two, uh, our two other terms. Uh, one of uh, them is just like in Hante, Senhu, which uh, mm, violates the boundary between fields and stripes, and another is uh, like uh, our usual narrow, which begins from stripes and ends at gives it holes. Mm. There is a very elaborate uh, system in Chukchi. Uh, which there are three uh, terms which can be uh, which can be translated in English like narrow. So there again is a dedicated uh, layer thing for layers and. So, uh, for Chukchi I mm, show only roots, because they of course can be either, ad mm, okay, they just can have either adjective or variable syntactic distribution. So, uh, there is uh, a single term for thin pivots, narrow stripes, Narrow roads like in hunting, a term which applies to stripes and roads, and a term which applies to roads, cubes and holes. So uh, the last one looking more like our usual narrow. So uh, it turns out that roads can be uh, described by narrow roads can be described by three. Uh, different dimensional terms, and the speakers do not see any mm, any semantic difference between them, applied or not. So uh, the next and most intriguing case is uh, on the slide, which seven. These are our preliminary data in UDI. So uh, these are based on uh, a, mm, on, on two speakers. We send a questionnaire on the internet. It is mm, maybe mm, they uh, do have more uh, uh, small size terms, but mm, so uh, they are at least consistent with each other. So they mm, use the same term to refer to thin layers, thin pivots. Uh, narrow stripes, roads, and cubes and holes. So a narrow window is lexified the same as a thin layer of snow. So it is another way to violate the boundary between pivots and stripes. A rather dramatic case of violation. So maybe. Uh, this tendency that the boundary between pivots and stripes needs to be violated in the small sizes to be violated in the large sizes a kind of implication universal for your know, for not in Eurasia uh, deserves an explanation. Maybe we have some and very obvious. So the fact is that small size smooths out all topological differences. A narrow board resembles a, thick, a thin stick much more than a white board resembles a thick tree because the very differences between, um, say, um, um, stripes and pivots are um, in that the stripe can be wide, and the and the more wide it is, uh, the um, uh, the 
greater its difference. So it might be case that mm, the differences between mm, so this uh, generalization can be explained in that way. So. Uh, Mm. Do not uh, go to the slide 39 yet. I want to ask you a question, a final question. Uh, what can be the connection between lattice terms, which is thick and wide, narrow and thin, and the outer terms, which, which are long, deep, high and tall? So where could be the connection in our semantic map to make it a chain? Anybody? So Clement, how would you say I fall in the deep snow? What? In French. Can you can you give us as well? Uh, yeah. 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 So, it is the connection. Penetrable layers like snow, mud, and sand, and impenetrable layers like ice or cloth or books, and so on, can be lexified similarly uh, based on their just topological properties on their geometry, on their shape. Uh, so, uh, it appears, mm, uh, it appears, uh, uh, certainly, except, uh, certainly besides um, applied to snow, can be applied as well to, uh, to uh, I, I think you can say thick eyes, thick clothes, and so on. Impenetrable and penetrable layers sometimes get collectified. But on the other hand, penetrable layers also get collectified with the water bodies. So, and uh, th this is what we are going to discuss tomorrow. So, that's it for today.